Welcome to another episode of The High Ground, powered by Premier Companies. Ryan, how are you doing today? Great. How are you? Good. We've Good. got a, another special guest with us today in the studio is uh, Scott Sharp, Vice President of uh, Crop Nutrients and Operations at Premier Ag. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, you got invited, what, about an hour? Oh, uh, yeah. And that's, we see you brought a bunch of prep work there. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, uh, yeah. So this is my so my people, hour. People who don't think people who don't think this is unscripted. Scott's your example. Yeah, our <laughs> listeners have no idea. We got somebody walking down the hall. Hey, hey, what are you doing? You got time for a meeting? Right. They're all starting to catch on. Scott hadn't caught on. He was a new <laughs> new blood. He was getting coffee. Right. <laughs> but uh, it's a. I mean, it's a great topic for right now. And timestamp this a little bit. We're in uh, September of 2022. And uh, I've I've known Scott for thirty years, uh, a little bit more than that probably, and and um, he has a uh, I'll give him an introduction. Um, he started off as uh, Jackson Jennings and manages a fertilizer branch forest at Jackson Jennings, and uh, years ago, uh, Purdue graduate and uh, and a uh, lovely lovely bride yep. and a beautiful girl that was just now finishing vet school. Yep, uh, I figure I get a pay raise here in about a year, so uh, that, that's good. But yeah, she wants to be a zoo veterinarian. How does that pay? Not real well. <laughs> um, you'd be surprised. You think specialty animals, all that, but uh, a lot of gals want to do that. So. Of, I know my little girl does too. So <laughs> A lot of supply and not much demand. So, I think yeah. it's the money's in cats and dogs. Yes, yes, yep. very much so, very <laughs> much so. <laughs> but uh, what he did uh, after being a branch manager, he was the agronomy manager for Jackson Jennings Co-op and then uh, continued with uh, that responsibility for, for operations and uh, crop nutrients, fertilizer, uh, through the the first merger of Premier Ag and then on through the second merger. Correct, yeah. So uh, I guess one of the things I'm going to ask uh, Ryan to get us started here is just kind of explain a little bit about uh, – the fertilizer that we spread on the corn and soybean fields, where does where do we, where does that originate, and how does it get here? Tell us a little bit about how we ended up with it in our barns, and then how it flows out through the operations. All right, so uh, for the most part, you get to we're a river market, and uh, we'll, we'll have some uh, some rail in the area, but uh, for the most part, it's it's a river, and uh, so a lot of barges. <clears throat> Those barges could come from, um, I mean, true imports. They could come from, uh, I guess we, we kind of refer to Canada as an import, even though we kind of think of them as being part of us, too. But that is an import if it comes from Canada. Uh, and a lot of times that actually would get railed down to the river, then put on uh, either. So at uh, some of the terminals, they can either they can bring rail in, they can put it on a boat or on a barge, they can rail it in, put it in a warehouse, so on and so forth. So... Uh, most of it uh, would actually hit a warehouse first. We okay. got some. I mean, with that rare exception, would we uh, go off a barge straight to a truck and then on to its destination, whether that be us or a farmer or what have you? For the most part, it's going to go in a warehouse, um, sit there till we're ready to pick it up, and then we would semis haul it to our locations and we uh, we unload it. So we get to handle it a couple, three times, but that's uh, it's been handled two or three times before it even gets to that point. So then it uh, gets in our barns, and then um, and, th- and then what do we do with it at that point? So we'll uh, – it we, depends on the, the application we're going to make. Uh, you know, it's going to more than likely get blended. So you'll take, you know, whether it's a potassium and a phosphate product, blend those together. We're going to put that on a – we call it a tender truck. It's uh, basically uh, – we have semi-tenders, but they have augers because, you know, we're not unloading into a pit. We've got a machine that's out in the field – We've got to be able to get up over the top of that 13-foot-tall machine, get it in the bed. And then uh, most of what we spread is actually is variable applied. We call it VRT. And uh, so that's where we just we have samp- soil samples on a two-and-a-half-acre grid for the entire field, entire farm. And then we'll uh, make a prescription map, just like we'd have a prescription for a medicine or something like that. This is a prescription for that field. And then as that machine drives through the, through the field spreading, the rate we put on varies based on the needs of the soil. So that, uh, how much do those machines cost? Oh, those are the inexpensive ones. They're <laughs> only about four hundred fifty thousand. Four. <laughs> <laughs> the sprayers, are the ones that get uh, get expensive. They're only six hundred. Six hundred thousand. Yeah. So, um, and those are all dry products. But then you also handle liquid. Uh, yes. We have liquid fertilizer too. 
And so, some of that is we apply uh, when we would, uh, so liquids for the most part is going to go on a corn crop. Um, some of that's done with a planter, so we call it row starter uh, because we, a starter fertilizer, and that goes on with the planter. So the farmer is actually applying <coughs> that. And then um, we can, uh, the other liquid uh, would either be, we would spray it on the field as we, we spray the crop protection products for that corn crop before, it come, you know, before it's out of the ground. Um, and then the majority of it would be what we call side dress. So that's after the crop is up and, uh, you know, they'll take an applicator that uh, can apply, you know, the, the nitrogen on the field that way. Hmm. We'll try to get And on it. top of all that would be uh, anhydrous. Yes. Well. Oh, yeah. So. Yes. Yep. Which is a gas and a liquid and a... Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, uh, it's, it's all of those. just depends on what the temperature is. <laughs> exactly. it, it could be anything. <laughs> we'll try to get some pictures up there yeah, just for, so sure. for the uh, uh, viewers. But So there's a lot uh, going on now with price volatility. I know... Certainly. Uh, I'm a little bit of your soundboard. I don't have any input, but I listen. And uh, tell Co- us, tell commiserate. Us, yeah, I commiserate. Right, right. I was like, man, that sucks. Yeah, <laughs> that I'm glad I'm not making that decision. Yeah. <laughs> tell us a little bit about what's going on that's, that's driving some of the, the pricing now. Well, and um, I liken it to, uh, I guess I'll start off with a story to, to explain what I'm going to explain Uh I judged soils while I was at Purdue, which has nothing to do with this discussion, but I'll get to my point. And, uh, you know, after you, you, the first couple of years I did it, I thought, well, this isn't too bad. And then, you know, fairly easy decisions. And, and uh, you think as you do it longer, you get it's easier, right, because you've got experience. And what you learn is there weren't three possible answers. There were seven possible answers. You just didn't know about those other four, right? So the more knowledgeable you become on something like this, it almost – clouds it because now you've got more variables than what you were dealing with before and so uh yeah you don't worry about what you don't know exactly. until you know it <laughs> and it's like oh, oh oh crap i should have known yeah. Yeah. that was now wrong. i'm worried <laughs> no wonder my attitude's so yeah. good all the time yeah. there you go <laughs> if you don't know anything you're pretty happy <laughs> what the comedian said uh, ignorance is bliss unless you know about it <laughs> yeah <laughs> Oh, but um, so, you know, part of the problem is, is there's fundamentals, okay? So what's, what's the price of grain? What can, what can the market bear? Meaning, you know, if the price of corn is $4 and beans are $10, that can only bear so much. The farmer can only afford so much for his crop, you know, crop nutrient application. <clears throat> corn $6 and beans are $14, that changes. And, you know, the manufacturers, the producers of fertilizer, I mean, they're not price gougers but they're also i mean they're in a business to make money and if the market will support it that's it's no different the housing market or anything like that you know the the market bears what it will bear lumber price whatever it is correct right you know and if there's a shortage you have to ration the supply or demand and you do that with price that's the only way you can do it i mean so those are what i would call fundamentals right and those are easier to work with because you can correlate corn is this you know the last time corn was four dollars Anhydrous ammonia cost X, right? And then this time, corn's 10% higher. You can do some math. You say, and it doesn't mean that ammonia's 10% higher, but, you know, they have, you know, if it's, you know, 10 cents, or if it's a dollar higher, they have another $200 worth of disposable income, right? How can they that, hmm. that kind of direct how that market can bear that price? Then you throw in geopolitical factors. And they've always existed. We're just aware of them now. Back to the ignorance is bliss. You know, 25 years ago, we didn't have the Internet. Yeah, we were aware of them, but we didn't think about the impacts and all of those types of things. And that's what we can't, ma- we can't manage. You can't protect that risk because you don't know what they are. I mean, you don't know who's going to drop a bomb tomorrow or, you know, or <laughs> get mad at somebody or what yeah. have you. And so, you know, when those start impacting it, I mean, that's when you get extreme volatility. And I just fear the unknown, too. So let's talk about supply quickly as we talk about geopolitical things that would affect that. How much of our export fertilizer, how much fertilizer would be produced in the United States that might be outward facing as far as exports that in the event of some major geopolitical action, could we turn those exports inward and say we're still self-sufficient? I mean, I mean, we could be hmm. close to self-sufficient on a lot of products. Um, urea, no, uh, certainly 
I guess, again, back to uh, potash, we kind of think as Canadians as our neighbors, right? Not really an import. I, so I think... It's our uh, attic. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we keep it stored in our attic. <laughs> you know we have Canadian listeners. <laughs> I said I think of them as neighbors. <laughs> it's a nice attic. Uh, it's, it's, yeah. It's been rem- I say we're using it. Grief. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, you know, again, uh, you know, it's, it's just not us, though, right? You know, I mean, again, how do you uh, – supply is tight. Uh, what if Brazil says they'll pay 50% more for that same ton of fertilizer? These co- it's going to go where the money is. And, yeah. uh, you know, and there's times that uh, we call it NOLA, New Orleans, Louisiana, and that's kind of the, the benchmark. Everything gets referenced to NOLA. No matter where it's going in the world, that's kind of the reference point. And, you know, how do you keep it? in NOLA, how do you get it out of NOLA based on price, right? Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, there, there's times that NOLA may be trading $100 under the world market. There's times that it, and what that means is that imports aren't coming, right? Because they've got better alternatives. Now, it'll eventually come if they run out of places to take it. Demand falls on the, you know, those other places. And so it's kind of a, just a dancing game. <clears throat> but... Um, to answer your question, I guess, Ryan, as far as, you know, could we become more, you know, self-sufficient if we stop those exports? That That's tough to do because we don't own those companies. Right. Yeah. You know, and right. as much as they, they, you know, those companies uh, depend on the American farmer for a lot of their income, they also depend on Ukrainian farmers and Brazilian farmers and so on and so forth. So, um, you know. And that if, was my point. It's not easy. No. It's not. I mean, uh and again, you're also dealing with foreign companies, right? Canada is foreign. I mean, th- yes, I mean, that's that we don't, we along with Canada, right? As politically we do. But that still doesn't mean that they owe us anything or they owe the American farmer anything. You know, we're co op, Premier Companies is a cooperative. And unfortunately, uh, many years ago, we got out, we owned a company, a cooperative called CF Industries, and we sold it. And that's how you could protect that. You know, it's no different than our country mark refinery. You know, at the end of the day, they will see that, you know, the, the, we the have Indian, supply and we have the farmer farm. has it. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And, uh, but those days are gone. So, so right now, I mean, with the, the natural gas, I guess, uh, for those who have tried to been avoiding some news and, uh, you know, we, if you're not watching what's going on in, in, uh, Eastern Europe, uh, but right now, uh, the demand for natural gas is so high and that pricing is is factored into it almost certainly you and, know and uh <laughs> the um and there's a lot of needs or a lot of uses for natural gas obviously produce fertilizers one of them uh heating homes certainly and but it's also used in a lot of manufacturing and um you know when that supply is disrupted again that price is trying to ration demand and uh you know uh in a very simplistic term whatever indus- industry or entity can extract the most margin or value out of that unit of natural gas is probably going to win, right? Because they can pay more. And, you know, fertilizer is probably not one of those things that can extract that, that much margin. Right. And, you know, and, you know, if you take a manufacturing plant that's making active ingredients for crop protection products, they're going to get a lot of value relative to a fertilizer producer for those tons for that unit of uh, natural gas. So, I mean, and then, you know, there's the, the political front too. I mean, it's going to get, it's not winter yet. And at some point in time, you know, uh, uh, Europe's going to have to figure out if, if, you know, if they're going to run factories and make fertilizer or if they're going to keep their people warm. Wow. So that's, uh, brings us into September of 22. What, what's the, uh, I guess the short term outlook. I mean, as we get ready to take a crop off and, and apply fertilizer for the next year, how far fertilizer is probably going to go on this fall. So, right. So what are we looking by market wise right now? Obviously, obviously there's, there's a lot going on. What are the trends? Not necessarily prices, but what are our trends looking like? So, um, is volatile and okay. Encompassing sure, answer. Is that, sure. <laughs> and that's it. And, it'll go up. And, all right. Well, it'll that wraps up. it. <laughs> it'll go up, go down or stay the same. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Bill, <laughs> Bill Howes and I just had that conversation a couple of days ago. He says, I can, fit, I can sum it up real easy. It's going to go up. It's going to go down. Let's go back up. And uh, no, I mean, general, uh, you know, when we, we talk about phosphates and potassium, uh, those prices, they softened a little bit from spring and uh, then they've kind of stabilized. So I think, um, you know, we're uh, a little below where we were last spring. Uh, so that's good news. But, 
the folks that spread fertilizer 12 months ago are going to see a pretty good increase, right? Because we had a right. serious appreciation between hmm. October, November of 21 into the spring of 22. Um, nitrogens are going to continue to be volatile. Um, you know, we're getting back to the natural gas situation. And, you know, we talk about, you know, supply is going to be this, you know, well, we we're going to run out of UAN last year because of the potential tariffs from uh, Russia and Trinidad. We were swimming in it. Uh, I mean, so I, supply will eventually fix itself, I think. Um, but uh, I did see a report the other day where 23 projected, well, some entity projected uh, 5% more corn acres for 2023. And that would be, a, that's a big number. Wow. I mean, 5%, that's a lot. I mean, that's four or five million more, you know, four million some acres more. And uh, that could put a crunch on nitrogen a little bit. But so I think, you know, if a guy was spread last spring and he said, I'm going to do it this fall, he's not, he's going to actually be a little happier. Uh, the guy that spread last fall is probably going to have a little sticker shock. As we're talking to farmers and they ask, well, what would you do? I mean, as a successful farming operation has made these decisions to stick with a plan. Generally speaking, they stick with a plan. They're a right. ball fertilizer. They're a, they're a part of their nitrogen is ammonia up front. And they side dress some urea. And regardless of what these trends are doing with the, with the lack of being able to say definitively this is where these prices are going to be, I mean, a good option is to always say if you're happy with the success level that you've had in the way that it works for your operation, which for us, being far enough south, we don't do any fall nitrogen. Correct. So, I mean, it's not always just a bad thing to say stick with your program that's no, carried you this long. I guess so, I agree 100%. You know, and, uh, you know, I've said for years that uh, – you know, the guy that the farmer that pays the least amount for his fertilizer may not make the most money, right? Because they didn't, you know, yeah, he did that, but he didn't market his crop. Same that being said, the 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 fellow that got the lowest corn price may make the most money on an acre because he he tied that with his inputs costs, yes. and so uh, it's more about doing both sides of that equation than the price you pay. To your point, yep, yep, that's. Very good. I tell you, I don't have much else than that. I mean, I'd say uh, keep t- stay tuned and um, uh, just keep keep in contact with your branch managers and account managers, and um, you know use them as a trusted advisors. We go through this because you pass this information on uh, pre- pretty much weekly to all the account managers and branch managers. Yeah, I mean, and we're very transparent with our customers, right? You know, uh, I mean, I always, I mean, I've told folks, you know, uh, you know, could the market go down ten or fifteen dollars? Sure. Could it go up twenty? Sure. And I understand, you know, I, you know, I tell a, a customer, I, I'm respectful that money is just as, is better in your pocket than theirs. But let's think about that true impact. I mean, fifteen dollars an acre or a ton. And you're spreading 200 pounds. That's a dollar fifty an acre. Let's not get wrapped up on that. That's less than a penny a bushel of corn. So let's not make a bad decision on emotion. Let's let's get down to the the mechanics and the the math. Well said. Yep, that's well said. So, I, I don't have anything. I don't have that, anything that was, else. That was very informative. Yeah, yeah. thanks, Scott. Appreciate you yeah. coming in today on such a long notice and yeah, uh, yeah. all the prep. I've work. had it on the calendar for quite a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Don't forget your notes when you leave. You may you may be asked to guest star somewhere else as well. Yeah, you can take the place right on with you. <laughs> well, that's another episode of the High Ga- High Ground Power by Premier Companies. Thanks for listening. Thanks.